Welcome to the National Real Estate Network video training program. This video is part of a series designed to help beginning and experienced real estate investors with the different aspects of purchasing and investing in properties. Be sure to click become a member at 27monthlymeetup.com. Dispose. Okay, bring the next one's expired listing. That's a good thing to work on. It works. Uh, and but somebody that's had their house on the market for a long time, their listing's expired, and uh, it's, you, there's an opportunity to go put a deal together with them. How did you find them? And, um, realtor. Now, on an expired listing, um, realtors think for the, their, their clients, and that's a mistake. Um, that's why I get upset when I see I pull up and I see a realtor sign in front of a house I went to because it doesn't allow me to have a conversation with the owner of the house to see what they really want to do. So a lot of times, the, and it's really a tragedy in foreclosures because realtors list the houses above the market price, above everything, and they don't do the, the seller a service. And they can actually get the people out of the situation and they can get them out with some money from if they were handling it properly. So, um, on the expired, it's the exact same situation. A lot of times, it, they didn't listen to what the people really wanted, or they gave bad advice and when they said to the people in the beginning, and they didn't really show them what the comps were on the property, or have a really straight conversation with them about where they're at inside their listings. So, uh, vacant homes uh, is excellent. You just need to look for them. If you can spot something with the grass high and weeds growing and the gutters hanging, there's an opportunity there. And that's the other point I want to point out is it's not just the fact that you're looking for no wonders, it's you're looking for a certain kind of property too, and it's usually property that needs repairs. So ugly properties are a good thing. So whether you like it or not, you're going to be in the rehab business or you're going to need to be able to have customers that are in the rehab business. Um, Unemployment office is an incredible place, and I had a friend of mine that got some type of unemployment magazine that I was doing television advertising, and he was doing advertising in the unemployment magazine, and his leads were exceeding my leads. And I don't know what magazine it was, I just know that people that uh, have had signs next to unemployment offices or somehow been able to tap the unemployment list or whoever would be know about unemployment, maybe it will be a company that's laying people off, or maybe somehow you advertise for that, but there's opportunities there for uh, don't wanters. Uh, billboards work. Uh, we used to put billboards up for charities, and we would, uh, you could get really great deals on billboards if you'd let them rotate them, put them in a rotation, in other words, they'd put them where somebody who wasn't taking the advertisement, you could get reduced prices on them. Uh, so uh, they're not as expensive as you think when you, you're taking their unwanted signs or you're allowing them to move your sign around. So it's something you can look at. Um, bus benches are outstanding. And I, so, um, well, my wife, she got upset with me because I didn't share the one thing she, uh, you know you're stupid when, okay? So you know you're stupid when you lay down with dogs with fleas, because I had done that. So you asked what the biggest mistake it was asking me when I made, it was who I associated myself with. So you really want to look at like who you're playing with. So like when you, you know, um, I went to, um, there was a seminar in Chicago put on by Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, and Robert Allen. And they did a great job of, of, of saying, like, if you really want to make a difference in this world, you should be earning some money to be able to make a difference in this world. And they, they were talking about the Mark Victor Hansen shared how he was talking to Tony Robinson. Tony Robbins. Robbins. Robbins, yeah. And he was uh, making a million dollars a year. You know, he thought he was pretty good. He goes, I don't understand, Tony, how you can make you know, millions of dollars. And he says, well, I'm hanging with billionaires and you're hanging with millionaires. So that was, I mean, it was the truth. And so when you look at who you're playing with, 
look at their, whatever their conversations coming out of their mouth is actually your conversation. So you need to like shift if you want to be doing deals, start getting yourself with deal makers that are actually out there doing deals or people that are playing on like, you know, or look for people that are being very successful. Like I get some coaching from a guy, his name is Mike Staff. He's a radio announcer at Rift. He's been on there 16 years and he has a DJ business and I'm, I'm just, he has like 18 DJs. On one weekend he can do 18 weddings. And he's got a phenomenal business. And he is very, very, very successful financially. So I go like hang out there, because I mean, you leave there inspired and get a lot of ideas about, his business is no different than my business. It's the same thing, it's about generating leads, it's about service, it's about that. So you can just start interviewing people that are up to something, that are making that. So, you know, works. Um, so that, that was, uh, that's probably the biggest one right there. So, um, okay, what's the next item? Ben, uh, signs, I think we've talked that one pretty much done. TV ads, if anybody's got a small television and wants to bring it in tomorrow that you can pop a, what do you call those things? The VCR. VCR, and uh, I'll, I'll play a television commercial that we did. That we're still doing. So if you want to see it tomorrow, has anybody got a small TV you can do that with that wants to bring it in? I got one. I bring it on. You bring it in? Okay, so we'll, we'll watch that DVD tomorrow. Or, I'm sorry, V, what is it? DVD. Okay, that. Yeah. I'm technically impaired. So. Hey, how much does that I think they were generating like 60 calls in a week when they were on. We'd run them on two weeks and off two weeks, but they still generated calls the two weeks they were on. I don't know that for an absolute fact, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Because I was dividing the leads every week. So we were spending $2,000 a month at that time. Now what I've discovered is, is that I was on like, um, I was on WB, so I was on the train train. I was putting some stuff in some certain areas they were more expensive. And I was getting just as many calls when I was inexpensive. The uh, don't wanters that are up at night that can't sleep because they lost their job and that. I think you'd be better off to target the late night on that. And I get up, they're, they're an expert in television advertising, so. Um, what would you like to ask me about television advertising? <laughs> when the, like if you were gonna, Put the, I buy, I'm going to play a commercial in the morning. I'm going to ask you when would be the best time to put that commercial on. You're not wrong. You want to go to where the people who are financially distressed are actually watching television. If I had to guess right now where guys that have lost their jobs are watching, they're probably watching Spike. You were looking for a dollar a holler television. That's narrow cast cable, not broadcast. Because you're going to pay a lot of money to be on Oprah. You're going to pay a lot of money to be on Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy. But you could go, if you watch where the infomercial guys are, are buying their time, those channels, and, and if you're looking for the programming, where would you, where are guys with insomnia or gals with insomnia watching? Or if you wanted to get women, single women head of households, You've got the uh, WE, W-E network, Lifetime. Lifetime. Um, that's pro those are probably the two best for inexpensive. Maybe Oxygen, which Oprah has a piece of. But once again, if you want the guys, you probably couldn't afford ESPN, but you could afford Spike. It's only a couple years old. That's probably where, where, I, would, where I would be advertising. Okay, can I talk like your expertise, or is that okay? You can say anything okay. you want. You Larry's, Larry's actually famous. It's Larry Corn. He was on television around the clock. He asked the attorney. So that's who's in the room. I had 15 years on ABC Radio. I did the Ask the Lawyer Radio Show, which was the first legal question and answer show in the United States. I stopped that in 1992. 
and I advertised, I was the first advertiser on TV in Michigan, legal advertiser, I started in 1982, and advertised up until <coughs> 2003 in this market. We were also in Pennsylvania, Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Wisconsin, a few other states. So I had a little bit of experience in market. Yeah. So we'll show the commercial tomorrow and get his expertise on where it should be. It's pretty good expertise. So, but basically what we discovered, like, is the, the, because you track when the ad calls come in, but the late night stuff where your commercial's going to run you 25 bucks, 50 bucks, is as good as the prime time stuff that's running four and five hundred dollars. So, it, it's an effective method. So, I don't know if that answers the question. There's a, a woman named Ronnie Deutsch who does bankruptcy advertising late at night. She's going after the exact same demographic. So, if you see somebody who's advertising to the same market people in financial distress, that's where you know. If it's working for them, and she's been on for several years, if they're on a long time, they're only on a long time because it's working. working. It's working. And how do they know if it's working? Television is a concept called direct response. If you show the ad and the phones don't ring, you're, on the wrong you're fishing in the wrong hole. So if it's been running for a long time, if you see the bankruptcy people late at night, make a note when you're surfing. Where are the bankruptcy lawyers advertising? They're trying to help the same people you want to help. That's really good. Thanks. That's a million dollar tip here. <laughs> okay. Newspapers. That is a very, very effective way to buy houses. Now, you want to look to be in newspapers where you don't have a lot of competition. So you can go with the smaller publications, church magazines, um, what Metro Times, is that one in Detroit? What are some papers that are smaller papers? Real Detroit. Yeah, Real Detroit. So you want to go in there, I buy houses for cash in any condition. And the, if you're going to be in like Detroit News and that, you can go in the Sunday, you know, go on the website. You want to figure out with the local papers how you put yourself at the top of the list. Like some papers have, like if you put asterisks in there, or you put AAAAA, they'll move you to the top. You've got to find out how you get at the top. And it's it's based upon consistency. When I was in Pontiac, I ran every day in the open press. I knew exactly who else was in the open press. I knew what my competition was going to say when the phone rang. I knew that Shirley Foote was going to want to list the house. I knew Alan Fatel was going to go out and be a man of few words. And I knew that, you know, so you've got to find out what your competition says. So you need to call the competition. Now, I want to tell you that that is a great lead source, is the papers, because they're are people that are getting leads already, paying for them, and they're after their niche. They're looking for a house that they want. They're thinking in a box that's way smaller than the box you should be in after you leave leaving here. So you need to get the leads that they're throwing away, because they're throwing them away. You want to go to look in um, the yellow pages. There's yellow page ads that say, I buy houses for cash. Because they get their ad in there, and then they get sick of the business. They become a worn out landlord. There's just leads being wasted. And that's an opportunity for you to pick those up for nothing. And I have a telemarketer that sits at my office and calls for leads, and all I do is give her the classified ad out of the Detroit News. And she generates leads that we buy. So this is not rocket science. She's, she's a very, it's borrowed, you've seen her at the office, people love talking to her. Yeah, you know what, I've got another four houses here, and she just chit chats with them and she gets the houses, and then we go out and shoot the pictures and we're off and running with it. So newspapers are an incredible resource. Now, <clears throat> it's race to the swift when you're running an ad in there that says I buy houses for cash. That's why tomorrow you've got to be able to write a purchase agreement and take the deal on Right there, when I talked earlier today, I told you about a deal I lost with a house on a lake, and that was because I had to drive back to my office to get the purchase agreement, and the time I got back, it was gone. That was an ad out of the paper. 
you can't, you have to be able to take property and pass very quickly. And you have no, if you're an engineer, you have no time to analyze the property. You're not going to analyze the property. Tomorrow I'm going to, you're going to learn how to put escape clauses in your purchase agreement so that you tie the deal up, analyze it later. And the newspaper ad, so did you find uh, Sunday is more effective than the weekdays or about the same? What is your experience then? Have you tracked it? I, I didn't track it, so I just, because we were in Pontiac, we were running every day, you know. And probably Sunday's the best paper to be in, I guess, Saturday or Sundays. Newspapers, what else about newspapers? So it's race to the swift, so you've got to be able to go out and put a deal together and get it signed, okay? You can't take real, great deals in real estate don't happen in slow motion. Email broadcasts. Now that's something that's available to you if you want to do inside partnership with me or create your own. And I'm going to recommend you create your own. You need to capture every email address you can get. You need to find some type of system where you can do broadcast. In all these group meetings you go to, you want to start capturing emails. You want to create something on your own website that when somebody sends something to you that you can capture their email address too. Like I'll send you the seven secrets of or I'll give you my free email, or I'll give you something in exchange for your email address. Because that is like the key. When, when anything I want in real estate, I can do an email broadcast out, and it goes out to 4,000 people. So if you've got something you want to buy, or you're working with a customer, remember we're talking about listing customers too. So when you're at these meetings, if they say I want to buy a house in West Bloomfield, at da 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 all I have to do is do an email broadcast out, and I can get back a whole list of people that want to sell at that. So it works very well. Mark, oh, are you familiar with any particular software that is uh, friendly for doing email broadcasts that is not too expensive? Can you show you that with us? We have a web guy here. Yeah, most uh, web servers, like if you have AOL, anything like that, you just have to, if you're gonna send, like Mark's got a list of 4,000 people, right. you have to, if, if he was using AOL to do that, and I don't think he is, but for example, you have to tell AOL, this is what I'm doing, you know, I have permission to send this out, and you know, typically, I mean, it's a, it's a phone call, and they'll just mark it on your account. You don't even really need to buy the software, you just compile the email addresses in a spreadsheet like Excel, cut and paste them into the VCC, Make sure you do it in the VCC, because you're blind copying. You don't want, because what you end up doing is giving everybody your email list if you, you know, set it up. And then it, it's just that easy, so. Um, what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm an internet uh, e-learning person, so. so. Like uh, online e-learning programs. That's the day job. Yeah. Do you create a website? We, yeah, I know how. I mean, I don't typically yeah, I mean. <laughs> so that works very well, so I'm my own point. So uh, reonetwork.com we talked about, that would be where you would go find what? Test question. REO, REO agents. BPOs. And BPO agents, okay? Okay. Uh, Brochures and restaurants, you've gone to placemats and restaurants. I buy houses for cash. Um, on the restaurants, you want to have your business cards. A lot of restaurants have billboards or little uh, bulletin boards that you can put them up on. Hardware stores, beauty shops. I bet people that have a regular route where they go around and put their business cards up. If you don't have it already, one of the the, the people that uh, come to some of our meetings, um, Denise, she has like, she says, I buy houses for cash, and you just rip off the phone number at the bottom, it's got little bit of cuts. That works really well. She had leads off of that that she was working with. Um, party stores, you can go in and strike deals with the owners like what I was talking about, where the, the, you can get the double email thing coming out. Party stores, I have, uh, I've had two people in my past that delivered routes to party stores and service stations that worked for the newspapers. 
and they actually delivered my brochures to those to those party stores and they already know the owners of the party stores so they can get those brochures put into the party stores and the holders and you can just they'll take care of you for a long time i used to put them in the newspaper thing and then i they don't like that either uh, so you can't do that but it worked for a while um, brochures when you're out doing this business uh, homes that have been sold by the team. I have a, a list of all the homes that we bought and sold. I have like a thousand or so on there. Because when you're out talking to somebody, they need to see, establish some credibility, then a flyer on yourself. And if you're not doing stuff, you don't have anything to talk about, then you can put your team on there and talk about yourself as, a, and here's the team I'm associated with. This is what they've done. So, uh, hardware stores, uh, beauty shops we talked about, websites, you can create a website for uh, <coughs> for buys too, like attracting people in, and Peter's done that, and uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, on your leads, and it'll be on by Tuesday and if tomorrow, or if somebody wants to do a pass a sheet of paper around and give me emails, then some of the forms I'm going to talk about tomorrow and some of the stuff I'm going to do today, I will email you those forms. And one of the things I'm going to email you is a link where you can actually, like let's say that you get a lead, because Otis, now you're generating leads for foreclosures. You can sell those leads on the internet to people that will buy them. And then I forget what the percentages you get. And anybody that goes in and buys your leads, if they start selling their leads to it, then you become an affiliate under that and you start picking up money coming back. It's not big dollars, but it helps to cover your overhead and your cost. So and like for somebody like me, I've got like inactive leads of over the, recently I've probably got like about 2,000 inactive leads. I'm probably gonna sell all those leads, not sell them, but assign them to that website, and then people will pay to get those leads, and then I get a part of that every time. So I'll get that out to you. <clears throat> Okay, so what's the next slide? That's what's illegal right there. So, and that is my sign. So, that's. Okay, business cards. Those are the cheapest things you can do. And the more of those you can get to hand out, the better. And uh, just something simple. And it works. What's our next slide? Okay. The pre-inspection checklist, that's in your folder, so I'd like you guys to pull that out because or just I'm sorry, look for the cash call lead assignment. That's probably more simple form. I think there's a couple different forms in there. When you look. Yeah, there's actually two different lead sheets. One's called pre-inspection checklist. It looks like this. And then the other one is like a cash call lead assignment. So let's take the one, the, the bigger sheet first, and I'll just hand it back to you. Uh, The, the number one thing you want to get is their name when they call off a lead, and then the other thing that's the most important thing you want to get when you're getting a lead is you want to get their phone number, and you want to get their mother's phone number, you want to get where they're living, because what's going to happen on somebody that's in trouble, their phone their phone number is going to get shut, <coughs> excuse me, uh, shut off. So the person that's going to win in that situation is the person that has the phone numbers or how to get hold of them. So when you're dealing with a double winner, you really got to go all out to get as many phone numbers and as the best way to get hold of them that you can. And that'll put you in the driver's seat over your competition. Um, you want to just chit chat with them and find out the condition of the neighborhood 
is there board ups? You know, tell me about the neighborhood. Tell me about the house. Does the roof leak? You know, you want to get a flavor for what the condition of the house is. And if they're telling you that there's certain things wrong with the house, you've got a pretty good flavor about what the house would look, in, look like. Then early on in the conversation, you want to ask them, how much do you want for your house? And then later in the conversation, after you've asked more questions about the condition of the roof and this and that, you want to come back and say, if I paid all cash and closed immediately, what would you take? You'll see the price will drop about 25%. So then you want to get that price because now you've established what the next price level is. So you want to get as much information as you can. Now how we do this, and it's not, there is no right way to do something. I have somebody that's really good at talking to people. First of all, it doesn't even come to us. It goes to an answering service thing that's emailed to us. Because people call all times and hours. And so the second it gets emailed, <clears throat> Tony, who's our partner, and a lot of the signs you saw up there, she calls the people back immediately. And she starts to get a flavor for the house. The second she's got that, she emails it to Roy, who's my other partner, who goes by the house usually the next day, shoots a picture of it. And then he has seen enough houses and done enough deals in the market. He's got a pretty good flavor if you're going by a, a brick three-bedroom uh, in Detroit. Uh, and I don't really care where it is. And they want 15000 for it. Is that a good deal? Mm -hmm. And it looks, the you know, windows are in and everything. So if it, it's just common sense. So when you see something really good, then you're going to jump on that and get it. Get it tied up. And that's when you know you're going to move. So if you're working a full-time job, what Ryan's doing, then having somebody that'll go look at something right away or pretty quick and then get it tied up, that's how come they got the number of listings they got. Because when somebody's ready to go on this, if you're not responding to them, then they're gonna start calling other people. So it's back to you can't take real estate in slow motion. Sometimes when we get the deals, um, they're, they're, they're so hot, by not even shooting a picture, Tony knows that there's a deal. So then she's on the phone with Roy saying, you know, get there right now. So, um, now here's the beauty behind all this, is what am I doing? No, I'm not doing anything. It's called passive income because I am not in the system. So you you can create the same thing for yourself. Now, yeah, I'm coaching. Yes, the second they've got it tied up, if something's not moving, then I'm looking at it from a problem solving standpoint. I'm also trying to work on lining people up. But we've established certain customers that, that I established those customers originally that Tony's now selling the inventory to. So I've removed myself out of that system in totality. And that is the best moment in your life when you can do something like that. Because they put the whole deal together and closed it on a system that's been set up. So uh, there's some questions you want to ask on the lead generation point. You want to know what the motivation of the seller is and what the reason is. So if they said that uh, they need... Um, they've got a mortgage on the property. Tony's question is, um, she doesn't say, are your payments current? She goes, how many payments behind are you? Well, I'm not any payments behind. Because they're gonna say, well, I'm four payments behind. What does that tell you? They're in foreclosure. They're in pre-foreclosure. Maybe. So, you know, it's just, um, so she's got a really good flavor for it. Then she's gonna, there's a checkoff list here for you because you wanna make sure they've got the original deed. You wanna make sure they're there when you meet them with their driver's license. You wanna make sure they got any tax bills. If there's, if it's a divorce, you need a copy of the divorce decree. You need to know uh, the keys. You wanna make sure they're bringing the keys to the property with them. Because when you go to that property, you only wanna go there one time, okay? And we have properties we take in that we never go to the property. We've drove by it by the street, it looks good. We've had them bring everything to us. And, and sometimes those are under like advertising agreements. 
because if we're going to tie it up on a purchase agreement, we're actually going to go inside and look at it. But when we're looking at a house to buy, the whole time we're there, if it's with Roy and I, and Tony's done the proper work with the people, we're in and out in 20 minutes. That's looking at the house, and the only, everything on our purchase agreement, everything is filled out ahead of time. The only thing that's not filled out is the purchase price. So we're going in to hammer out that purchase price and, and be out the door. Uh, so you've got uh, old closing papers, title insurance, mortgage information, death certificates, because a lot of times somebody's died, then you know if you've got a probate estate problem or whatever. So you want all that stuff, and if there has been a death certificate and it's a husband wife, then you need to copy that death certificate to be able to close it. So you're trying to gather as much information up front as you can. And if they're giving you their mortgage information and bringing it with them, then you know what they paid for it too, right? So you need the legal description, you need all the stuff that you're asking for here. Now if they don't have some of that, don't, don't cancel the call, you're going to go anyway. If they have none of it, don't cancel the call, you're going to go anyway. It's just back to what Larry said, if you've got to do it on a napkin, do it on a napkin, you know. You, you don't worry about if you don't have something. Don't worry about whether you filled the paperwork out right or wrong. That's how you're going to learn this business. You just got to go do it. But then get on the phone like Javon and say, well, does this go there? Does that go there? And bop, 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 bop. You know? When you, um, you have people call that help, you know, the number that you got from Telcom, what, what's the script that you give to the Telcom phone person? Just, just getting basic contact information? Uh, no, I can. Okay, so somebody needs to make me a list. That'll be the first thing I email everybody is the script that Calcom asks the people when they call in. Okay. okay. So you want to keep a list, and then I'll provide all that. I'll email it out to everybody. Oh, okay. you just get an email list started? Yeah, somebody needs to pass a sheet of paper around with the email numbers, and then I'll send you my Calcom script, what they ask. Okay. Okay. All right, so do you see you just want to gather information? And that's all this, the other form is there. It's just a, to gather information. So it's like whatever you feel comfortable with. But you've got to have enough information that when you went out to resell your lead or you send it to somebody. Now, when I have people come in and deed off to me, right? Like they come to the office, they bring in everything, and we do everything I've never been in the house, but I've taken control of it, right? I don't have to worry about analyzing it because I'm going to send all my investors out to do that. So, do you follow that? I mean, it's like you want to eliminate your work process as much as you humanly possible. And I'll give you the, Gary, you started out, the total time to present a purchase agreement was in the beginning? Oh, at least an hour and a half. Two hours. hours. Two hours. Two hours. And now it's. Because I went over every clause. Yeah, now it's down to. Jeez. Oh, a half hour, 40 minutes. Getting, getting better. So. Mm -hmm. The most important clause for me to go over with somebody that will not have a, I won't have a problem to instill total confidence in them is like showing the attorney clause. It says that they can cancel this contract and then you put in the number of days. Three days, four days, that they should take it to their attorney. They should have it reviewed. If there's anything on here that's wrong, they get the right to cancel. That does not, I do not have people canceling contracts. If you've gotten right there and you're the first one there, and actually they have a lot more faith in your ability to get something done than somebody else's. Whatever you resist, like them going to an attorney, that's what's going to happen. So it's whatever you resist, persist. So like I'm like, I'm saying like here's this clause, I put this in there, I want you to take it to your attorney. I tell them, I want you to take it to your attorney. If you don't have an attorney, I want you to take it to a real estate person. I want you to take it to whoever you know that knows something about real estate and review this. If you have any questions, call me. You know, the more you do that, the less resistance you're gonna get. That's the number one clause that I make sure I go over every time. Hey Mark, with the pre- I'm sorry. Oh. Well, just quickly, with the pre-foreclosures, the people, all they want to do is show me the line where to sign, boom, that's it. So you're Yeah, they want to be gone. gone. Yeah. There is no legal obligation to explain any clause of any contract to anybody. It's presumed if they're over 18 and, and you know, not 
mentally retarded that they're legally responsible for what they sign. How much time do you spend when you're going over an offer to purchase with a prospective seller? We're in and out of the house, looking at the house and doing everything in 20 minutes or less. How much time do you actually spend explaining clauses of the offer to purchase to prospective sellers? We don't. We go, here's the price. We tell them we're not even the buyer. We say that we have an investor that's going to be the buyer. We're going to sign this purchase agreement. We're going to sign it for our profit. This is what we do for a living. And it's very quick. Boom, boom, boom. Hmm. Has there ever been any resistance to your offer to purchase where it says it's to you or ass and ours? Yeah, basically just any purchase agreement in the state of Michigan, you can assign. Unless it's a, somebody's put it there, it's not assignable, okay? So no, there's no resistance to that. We explain to them, we're not the buyer. I explain to them what I've got. I explain what my credentials are. They're looking to get, they don't want her, you're right. not. Right. Help me. Yeah. Take away my pain. And then what we've got is if it's something I'm not sure about, and we'll go over tomorrow, that I don't know whether I can even get it sold, because I'm signing PAs and stuff. I'm not signing a purchase agreement unless I think I can move it and get it gone. I am not there to, to mess those people up in any way, shape, or form. You need to be really clear about that. So if I'm not sure I can do the job, then what I'm going to do is sign an advertising agreement with them. And that then gives me the control because it allows me inside my advertising agreement to file a claim of interest against the property so no snaky, slimy investor that I've dealt with in the past that goes around me is going to go around me because I've never recorded against the property. And that's the nature too. I had a website and I had all these properties on it. I didn't have claims of interest recorded against it and I had people that I totally trusted going around me and closing on deals that I sent there. So. My purchase, we'll get into purchase agreements tomorrow, but I just, this, you need to gather the information so now you've actually got something to sell. Yes? For the advertising agreements, do you have to have a broker's license or do you have to have somebody with a broker's license to do that? Or? Okay, well, I'm, again, I'm not an attorney, but this is my understanding and I'm quoting uh, Lori, who runs Middleton Real Estate School. According to her, and according to all the articles I get, um, they're the aggregators, so the people that are creating these advertising agreements and websites, identical to mine, are not realtors. Ours is a real estate website, and it says we're realtors and all that. And what's happened is the multi-list services in those different states have been coming after those aggregators and bringing suit, and they're losing every case. So what, what's happening to the real estate industry is, is the aggregators without the license are winning everywhere. Because all it is is an advertising agreement. It's an agreement that says, I'm going to advertise your home on my website. If I bring you a buyer, you owe me a fee. You can also prepay for that advertisement, pay me a flat fee, I'm going to advertise your home, and it's going to go out, I'll email broadcast it out to 4,000 investors. I will. You know, it's the number one traffic site. It's the top half a percent of websites worldwide for traffic. You know, I'll make all those statements that are true. And if it, and I'm saying, I think in this market, in all the other markets, if I was not a realtor, that the MLS would not be able to, to stop me from doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to be the first court test case. So in my advertising agreement, it says that I'm a realtor, I give them an option if they want to put their house on the MLS or just on the website. And I'm complying with all the rules here locally. And I am a realtor. But the answer is, is could somebody that's not a realtor come in and work with me inside an advertising agreement? And I feel like the answer is absolutely yes. If you're not a realtor, does it have to be a flat fee? Or can it be a percentage? We do ours flat fee on our advertising agreements. But that's all a negotiation at the time you're there. So we, like if I was dealing with uh, a frugal investor, my flat advertising fee for his properties might be 1,500 to 2,500. If I'm dealing with a homeowner individual that's in trouble, it might be 5,000. I might be at their house having to do more work where the, the investor's emailing me stuff and faxing back and forth. So and we do it off flat fee. And if it's a, 
if it's a multi-million dollar hotel somewhere, it might be a flat $100,000 advertising fee. What do, you, what do you do once you have a lead? You've got to get the lead sheet. Any good questions? We'll take good care of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we got the phone number thing down. What's next? So you want to make sure you're filling out the inspection sheets. You want to market the lead. The second you've got the lead, if it's a good lead, now the question then becomes, all you've got is a lead, right? Mm -hmm. So now my problem is, is I know I've got a great lead, but I haven't got it tied up. And I'm really understaffed to be able to get them all tied up. So now how could I tie up or work something like that is I do a buyer referral agreement that says, Mr. Buyer, you're my buyer, I'm going to be giving you leads that I don't have tied up. And you owe me a flat $5,000 for every one you buy. So now I can send my buyer straight out, because I already know I got a good deal to tie it up, and I know I'm going to get paid. And not only do I send him out, I know he's going to be using my form to tie it up, because that's his agreement with me. My form says I have the right to file a claim of interest against the property. I want to make sure I get paid. So you can, you know, market the lead as just a lead to a buyer referral agreement. Does everybody follow that? And tomorrow we're going to go, th there's an extra buyer referral agreement in your forms. Now, the advertising agreement, the buyer referral agreement, the seller referral agreement, all those forms are not used in traditional real estate. They're all forms that were done by an attorney and taken to three different real estate schools. And I get the most respect for Lori that runs Middleton and been reviewed them to make sure that what I'm doing is working and it hasn't been questioned or challenged. So, so and you can sell your, your, once you've got a lead established too, you can then sell that lead on that list I was telling you about. So even if you're just generating leads on massive volume and selling them on the internet, that's another possibility for you. And we'll get that to you. Peter, where are we at next? Okay. So do you want to spend a minute going through an advertising agreement? Because everybody in the room could use one of those. It's not there's like you're not violating any laws to to use one, it just needs to have a real signature on it because that's what we agreed to. You want to, you know, they're in your forms packet. Anybody in the room filled one out and used it? Anybody? Okay, Mark, I need to stop you. Okay. I have no idea what you're doing. You need to not not that you need to tell me what you're doing now. You need to look at me and tell me now we're getting ready to because looking at you on television, I don't know what you're doing. Okay, fine. Thanks. So what we're about to do is we're gonna look at a way you can what you can do with a lead when you generate it. Another source for you is to get an advertising agreement. If you've gone to a house... By clicking the link in the description below, you can purchase the full version of this video in all the forms mentioned within, for only $7.99. Or, if you like, you can get access to all of our real estate investing videos at 27monthlymeetup.com. The cost is only $27 a month and includes all past meetings, three new meetings a month, plus all the forms mentioned. Thanks for watching.